right, all right. Praise the Lord. Good to see everyone here today. And a special Sunday indeed. Do you need this, brother? All right. All right, you take your time. Uh, we have, uh, this is a special uh, Sunday for, I uh, just want to put it out there right now that we've got several, a couple of our pastors that, uh, that are away today preaching in other churches across Southern California. We've got uh, Will Small, who is over at Mid-Cities Baptist Church on Newland, preaching there. That is his, uh, the church he grew up in. So they've heard now that he's an ordained pastor and all the things that he's doing here at Huntington. So they invited him back uh, to preach in basically what would be his home church. So you could imagine, that is a big deal for him, for his family, and for all that congregation that remember him. They call him Willie. Right, Willie over there. So little Willie is back uh, at uh, Huntington, uh, at, at uh, Mid-Cities Baptist Church. So, uh, so be praying for him and just rejoice with, with them. That's going to be exciting. And then uh, Pastor Michael Clark, he's over at First Baptist Church, San Jacinto. And uh, so he's preaching at Brother Stacy Johnson's church. Uh, that church is part of our Providence Collective that we're partnering together to plant churches. And so it's kind of cool that Huntington Beach Church has uh, expanded today, and we've got representatives spread out across Southern California, and that's what we're all about, amen? And it's sort of what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And so, in fact, I, I found an interesting uh, stat that I wanted to start off with today. You can see it here on the screen, and that is that Southern Baptists have planted 10,000 churches since 2010. Let that sink in. 10,000 churches uh, we've planted since 2010. That includes 917 last year. Isn't that amazing? This is what we're doing. I'm, I have uh, said it many times here at this church. We are part of something that has never been seen before. Something great. This generation and what's going on. You see, now some of you, you might be tuned in every day to the uh, mass media that's going to, that basically their business model is bad news, right? That's what keeps you locked in, telling you that the world's all falling apart. And uh, in certain places it is. And, and then you got all the politics, and they're all a bunch of idiots, amen? So that kind of gets you all fired up every day. But listen, I got news for you. None of what you see on the news and none of that bunch that you get mad about are in charge, amen? Jesus Christ is in charge. His church is growing and we are making a difference in the world greater now than ever before in world history. And so this is something to rejoice in. Now, with that in mind, a few weeks ago, I was asked to write an article and uh, have it published by the uh, California State, uh, so California Southern Baptist Convention. And that article was published. In fact, if you want to go on to our, uh, go to the sermon notes today, you'll be able to get that article if you haven't read it. But I want to bring to you some of the points of that article today. I want to work through that because I wrote it with Huntington Beach Church in mind. And so I want to share it with you today. It's what I called how to lead a movement. How to lead a movement. Because we're leading movements here at Huntington. We are a movement right here at this church when we began to revitalize seven years ago. And we have multiplied into multiple movements across the state of California. And then also there are movements inside movements. There are groups that are revitalizing ministries inside this church. And so across this congregation, there are some of you, men and women, that have been called by God to uh, lead movements. Movements may be a ministry in this church. It could be men's ministry or women's ministry. It could be a recovery ministry or evangelism ministry, discipleship youth ministry, children's ministry, church planting ministries, all that just inside this church and a lot more. Of course, there's movements that can be led in your home. Movements can be led out there in the workplace and in society. There's all sorts of ways that God may call upon you to do something greater than yourself. And so I want you to learn some principles from the Word of God that can help you in this endeavor. And to do so, we're going to be looking at the book of Nehemiah. Turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. 
If you have your church app, you'll be able to find it quickly. If you're old-fashioned and you still carry the book around like I do, go to the middle, you'll find Psalm, then turn, uh, go back toward the beginning a couple of books, and you'll find Nehemiah uh, right there toward the middle of the Bible. Nehemiah. And so as we look at Nehemiah, who was quite possibly uh, the greatest, one of the greatest leaders in, uh, in the Scripture... He's a man that truly led one of the greatest movements. Uh, his book in the Bible has a lot you can learn from. I'm, I'm barely going to touch the tip of the iceberg today, you might say. So uh, you might want to have a deeper study in this book, especially if you're going to be a leader. If you want to be a part of something great, you ought to become a student of the book of Nehemiah. Now, several points I'm going to pull out today. In the article, I wrote nine, but today I'm going to give you ten and I'm going to do them really quickly because 10 is a lot of things to cover. And I want to try to cover it uh, very quickly and respect your time today. So I'm going to say a lot. There's a lot left on the table I'm not going to be able to say. But I've put a lot into your study questions. In fact, you'll have a lot of fun this week. If you're in a life group or a Bible study or want to do those study questions that I've provided for you. If you don't know where to find them, go to the QR code. And you'll be able to download those uh, sermon notes and study questions. And, uh, and much more. Now, point number one, when it comes to leading a movement, point number one, you can write this down in your notes, assess the current reality. you got to assess the situation, the current reality. Nehemiah did this. I want you to look in Nehemiah chapter 1. Some of his friends had come to him and shared with him some news that disturbed him. And I'm going to pick up the story in verse number 3, and this is what it says. And they said to me, the remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's walls have been broken down and the gates have been burned. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before God of the heavens. If you skip over to chapter 2 and verse 13, you'll read about uh, Nehemiah going all through the city by himself and assessing the situation. In chapter 2, verse 13, he says, I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. And that's just one piece of his great inspection that he did on the city. My point to you today is, if you're going to lead a movement, if you're going to lead anything that's greater than you, if you're going to get other people involved in something that God is doing, you've got to first be very aware of the situation. Assess the situation. Before you go out and tell everybody what you're going to do, make any grand announcements, this is what God's told me to do, you better have done your homework and make sure that you're not only just have these great dreams, but you actually know what the problem is and you're aware of the situation. For me, that requires asking a lot of questions. You need to talk to people, especially people that are close to the situation that you might consider uh, experienced or even experts on that particular issue. I like what Nehemiah did. He studied that situation. In fact, I like the part back in chapter 1 where it says he sat down and he wept and he mourned for a number of days. You can write this in your notes. You ought to study the situation until it touches your soul. Before you do anything else, you need, to get, you need your soul to connect with that circumstance. If you're going to lead something great, it's got to come from in here. It's got to come from when you're within your heart. And I like the fact that Nehemiah took days to weep and to pray. He even says he fasted. In other words, his friends had come to him and given him a problem. But what Nehemiah was waiting on was for God to come to him and give him a calling. And that's what it takes to lead a movement. You need the calling of God. Not just an issue, but you need God's issue. Not just a dream, but you need God's dream. Why? Because I can tell you any movement worth leading is going to be difficult. You're going to want to quit. 
There's going to be trials. There's going to be troubles. It's going to stretch you. It's going to be harder than you can ever imagine. How many things have we started and we quit? How many things have we started and as in the middle of going well, we took off running because we got hurt? The only thing that's going to keep you from doing that is to have a calling from God in your life, to know why you're there. You can't just be there because you want to be there, and you can't just be doing it because others want you to do it. you got to be there because God put you there. Can I get an amen? So that's point number one. Point number two that I'd glean from Nehemiah is define your purpose. Define your purpose. In chapter two of Nehemiah, we see Nehemiah doing this. It says in chapter 2, verse 17, So I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let us rebuild Jerusalem's walls. Let us rebuild, let us... Notice there's a... This is something we're going to do together. This is our purpose We are going to rebuild these walls. And there's a reason for it. Notice the next word. So that we will no longer be a disgrace. See, he had a purpose. The purpose wasn't just the walls. The purpose was something bigger than the walls. It was because these broken walls in Jerusalem and ruins was a disgrace to the name of God and to the glory of God. He was wanting to do what he wanted to do, not just for what he was going to do, but for God, something bigger than himself. But he knew what success looked like. He said, we're going to go out here, we're going to build these walls. That's very specific. If you don't know what success looks like, if you start a movement, you'll quickly have people join you that'll have their own agendas. They'll define your purpose for you, and they'll hijack your movement. But Nehemiah knew exactly what he's doing and why he was doing it. In fact, you can write this down. Your purpose cannot be defined merely as a destination or a single objective. Instead, it should be defined as the actions or culture that it will take to reach a destination or goal. That's a lot. I want to to break this down for you. I wish I could spend all morning on this point. But this is some advice that you can glean and today that I'm telling you will make a difference in whatever ministry or whatever movement you're starting. And that is what you're doing cannot just be about just a single objective. It can't just be this is what we're trying to accomplish, period. It's got to be more than that. There's got to be a bigger purpose. Why? Because if it's only about a single objective, what happens when you reach the objective? The movement's over. You're done. Now, that's okay if that's what you're planning on doing. There are types of jobs where you got a single objective, you do the job, and that's done, moving on to the next job. That's not what a movement's about. That's not what a ministry's about. It's something bigger. Nehemiah said, we've got to build these walls, but it's about something bigger than that. It's about the glory of God. It's about Jerusalem becoming what it's supposed to be. It's about Israel once again being the nation that it was supposed to be. And there was a lot more to it than just walls, you see. And I'm telling you that if you want to build something in this church that's going to last What you ought to do is focus on specific behaviors and actions that will develop a culture because the culture is what you're really going for. You're wanting to see people transformed into a new lifestyle, a lifestyle of truly following Jesus Christ and living by faith. That's much bigger. That's an ongoing movement, you see. And this is what I'm talking about. You want to see something bigger. It's, it's more than just about what you're doing. It's about who you're becoming. Let me move to point number three. In this, you begin to develop a strategy. A strategy. You've got to have a specific strategy, and it's got to be something that works in a way that uh, makes sense. And, that you know, I don't have time to talk about strategies today, but what I like, if you move over to Nehemiah chapter 3, 
Go there with me. I'm not going to be able to read to you this whole chapter, but man, later on, if you want to just see something kind of cool, you just read the whole book of Nehemiah, and this chapter right here is exciting. Because if you look, look real closely with me and, and get your eyes to focus on key words like the word next, next to, beside, beside them. Look, look, look with me. Look down. Go to like verse number 2, for example. The men of Jericho built next to. And then a few words later, next to them. And then go down to verse Four, next to them, beside them, next to them, verse 5, beside, you see that? All the way down the chapter, you have this repeated word, next to or beside them. This was Nehemiah's strategy. This was Nehemiah's strategy. His strategy is if we're going to build these walls, what he decided to do <clears throat> was he took a group of people and he'd say, okay, I want you to build this section of the wall, which is happens to be right where your ancestors used to live. So this property next to this section of wall, that, that's your property. This is your new home. This is where your great-grandparents live, for example. This is where your, your ancestors live. So I want you to build the wall next to your home. And then next to them, he had another family. He's like, I want you to build this section of wall next to your home, the home of your ancestors. And he went all the way around the city of Jerusalem and he had every family build the walls next to where they were going to live. Why? Well, it's obvious. You're going to want that section of wall to be done right. Amen? You're going to be want, you want it to do, be done right. It was a strategy. It was a brilliant strategy. You know, there's so much you can glean from this. <clears throat> and the fact that he got everybody involved and that whenever it comes to strategies, especially in church, one of the things that's probably the best thing to do is uh, let people work on building the church, building their section of the wall, you might say, uh, in an area that touches their lives. I mean, maybe you're raising youth. You ought to consider being part of our youth ministry. Maybe you've got teenagers in the home. Maybe you've got children in the home. Maybe you ought to help us in our children's ministry. We need to revitalize it and grow it. Or maybe, maybe you're someone who, who, who knows a lot about recovery. Maybe God's helped you. Maybe you're, you've been in recovery. You ought to help us in our recovery ministry. Or maybe you've got music talent and singing talent. You know, it's obvious. You know, this is not rocket science. It's find out where, where God's work touches your life and put your hands to work right there. Amen? Join the movement. That's a strategy, and Nehemiah had this kind of strategy. He had clear plans, and there was a lot more to it than this, but this was the initial plans to get things started. And by the way, I want to mention this again. It's a running theme. It wasn't just about the walls. It was about a culture. What is a culture, by the way? A culture is usually defined as a group of people that have a shared set of values and beliefs and even actions. So in other words, if you get around a bunch of people that believe like you do and act like you do, then you probably have developed a culture. It might be your friend group. It might be a, a culture at your job or business. It might be a, a, a group of people out here in society that you hang out with Maybe the same people that y'all vote the same way or you support the same groups or maybe it's a culture around an a, a, a athletic team or some kind of hobby, right? That's a culture. A group of people with a shared set of values, beliefs, and actions. So I'm telling you, if you're leading one of the movements in our church or a movement elsewhere, what you want to do, here's a key, is focus on specific Behaviors, develop strategies that focus on specific behaviors based on your values. So that when people practice those behaviors, they're developing a culture because they're beginning to adopt your values. Because behaviors flow out of values and they work back and forth. 
What you do becomes what you believe. What you believe becomes what you do. And around and around it goes. And it develops in you a different culture. I remember seven years ago when, uh, when we were here revitalizing this church, we, uh, we wanted to develop a culture of loving the community. We just wanted to make sure that this church was known as a loving church that shared the love of Jesus. So you know what we did? We went out and did a pumpkin patch. Do you all remember the pumpkin patch we did many years ago? We did it a couple years in a row. And literally at that pumpkin patch, <laughs> all we did was give everything away. We just gave away hundreds and hundreds of pumpkins. We gave away toys. We gave away, every, I mean, if somebody walked in here and said they wanted these chairs, we might have gave them the chairs back then. You know what I'm saying? And there was nothing here we weren't willing to just give away for free because we were trying to uh, communicate to the community that the gospel of Jesus Christ is free. Amen? Jesus has paid for it all, and he loves you, and he will give you everything you've ever needed by giving you Jesus Christ. And that was our message. But here's the thing. We wanted to develop a culture of that in our church. And so what we were doing is we were choosing these activities that focused on these specific behaviors. And as people would get involved in this and they'd learn how to do it, all of a sudden that culture was created in our church. Let me move on to number four. And again, if you haven't uploaded the notes, you can see them here through this QR code. Number four is model the mission. Model the mission. Turn with me to uh, Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 16. You're going to love this. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 16. Nehemiah modeled the mission. Here's what that means. He said in verse 16 of Nehemiah 5, he said, Instead, I devoted myself to the construction of this wall. I devoted who? Myself to the construction of this wall. And all my subordinates, all of his staff, were gathered there for the work. What I see here is Nehemiah modeling the mission. He didn't just show up and say, hey, I'm in charge, I'm the boss, I'm going to tell all of y'all what to do. If you do that, you're not going to be much, you're not going to be the leader of a movement. Even if you get a big crowd, you know what you are? You're, you're basically a dictator. Or at worst, you might become a cult if you're in a church, you know, just the big guy on the pedestal telling everybody else what to do. That's not what we're into around here. What we're into around here is we're a family. We're in this together, amen? And our pastors and our leaders are practitioners of what we preach. That's why they're out there today, scattered all across Southern California. Why? Because we tell our people to get out there and spread the, the news, amen? We'll do it too. We'll be involved in everything that goes on here. We won't just tell you what to do. We'll say, follow us as we're doing it as well. And you model the mission. The reason we do this is because the best type of persuasion is not a lecture, but a demonstration. People learn best when they can watch someone else model the behavior. And what I find is people will come to Huntington Beach Church and they will observe us to determine whether or not what we're claiming we want to do is worth the hassle. And when we talk about all the things we're doing, so people just show up and they watch us. And what they're doing is they're watching to see if it's real. It's just, just a plan or a program. Is this just another church with its mission state? Or is or or is this a place where the group of people really have bought into what they're talking about? That it's real. That it's genuine. And people watch and they learn. And they not only hear what we're saying, but they see what we're saying. And that makes it make more sense. And when people see that, they begin to join your movement. and They become the new leaders, the new influencers. And at that point, your movement has really begun. Let me pause right here and give some advice to those of you who are leaders in our ministries. We've got women's ministry and men's ministry and recovery ministry and 
youth. We've got all sorts of different ministries in our church. A little piece of advice. Don't try to correct every wrong behavior of everybody that's joined your movement. Okay? Just a little piece of advice. When you have a big movement and a lot of people getting involved, at first, you're going to feel like you got to just correct everybody, make sure everybody's doing it the right way. Now, in reality, that's an impossibility, number one. And number two, you're going to end up running off all the people that wanted to follow you. Amen? Besides the fact you're not perfect yourself. So you're going to look like a hypocrite eventually. So what I have found is it's better to model the good behavior that you're wanting. Just as a leader, be the model. Be the example. Model the good behavior. And give people the opportunity to adopt that good behavior. And practice that good behavior. Because here's what I believe. You can write this down. Healthy culture self-corrects bad behavior. I believe that. Maybe you don't believe that. If you don't believe that, talk to me. I'd like to hear your perspective on it. And, uh, but it's just my piece of advice. This is just an, a side note. I believe a healthy culture self-corrects bad behavior. I believe that when people come into an environment that we've created and we've got going, we've got a movement going, they'll bring all their issues into that. And because of that, they're going to mess up a lot. And if you try to correct everything, you're not going to keep them very long. But if you let them come in and you love them and you work with them and you're patient with them, and you're modeling for them what you want them to do. And they're seeing it worked out. And they want to have what you've got. They want to see the successes you're having. They will begin to adopt the correct behaviors. And your movement will continue. So much more I could say about that. But i got to move on to number five. You might already hear what I'm saying when I say create a culture of inclusivity and collaboration. A movement is bigger than one person. It thrives on inclusivity and collaboration. In fact, if I had time, I'd read to you right now chapters 2 and 3 of Nehemiah because they just perfectly lay out the picture of getting other people involved and giving them ownership of what you're doing. In fact, Nehemiah, the first person he got involved in his movement, do you, do you know who it is? King Artaxerxes. The guy wasn't even a believer. The guy wasn't even part of Israel. Nehemiah worked for King Artaxerxes, if you know the story, and the first thing that Nehemiah did was share his vision with that king, and it so moved that king that that king actually invested in the vision and wrote letters to support Nehemiah, if you know the story, right? First thing that Nehemiah did was started getting other people involved. And then when, if you go to chapter 3 of Nehemiah, an amazing chapter, remember that's the one I said, next to this one was this person, next to this person was this person, and on and on it goes. In other words, he got everybody involved and they took on responsibilities and they became leaders of their sections of the wall and of the job. In other words, he gave away ownership of the movement. Let me put that up there on the screen. As people join your campaign, find ways to give them ownership of the movement. You know, we, again, model this. Our church has what we call a plurality of pastors, right? How many pastors we got here? I don't even remember. I lose count. No, I'm kidding. But... We, at this church, we got so many pastors, and we got pastors in training, and some people say, why do, you, why do you do that? Because I believe in this principle. I believe the movement of God is bigger than one person. Because this movement is not about any one person except for Jesus Christ, amen? And so having just constantly giving away the vision. It's so important. Now let me slow down and make sure you're hearing me. Women's ministry, men's ministry, recovery ministry, youth ministry. Listen, if you're the leader of that ministry, I'm asking you, who have you given it away to? Who have you given it away to? Who is now taking ownership of it? 
at the same level you are. You say, well, if I give it away, I'm not the leader anymore. But listen, Jesus is the leader, amen? amen? Give it away. Watch what happens. You'll still have plenty of work to do, amen? You'll still be plenty in charge of many things, more than you want to be, in fact, because as soon as you keep giving that thing away, it's going to expand. It's going to grow. This is what a movement is all about. You got to give it away. You got to trust others with the ownership. And again, it will remind you that it's not about you, it's about God. It's not your calling, it's His work. Amen? And so we model this and we want to see this all the way down the line. And by the way, when you talk about inclusivity, no culture is properly inclusive if God is not included. Amen? If God is not included. Everything you do should be focused on the Lord. What is His will? What is His work? What is His purpose? Everything you do. Pray, pray, pray. I find it amazing in the book of Nehemiah, you can't turn the page without Nehemiah praying again. Praying again. Always praying. Some of these prayers in here are like a whole chapter long. Some of his prayers are like one sentence. But he was a praying man. In fact, I think this is cool. There are 14 recorded prayers in the book of Nehemiah. There's many more prayers in there where it says, I went and prayed. I prayed for many days. No, 14 where he recorded what he prayed. And there's only 13 chapters. So what does that tell you? God was included in everything. Number six, I got to keep moving quickly. Number six, create small achievable goals. You notice what I wrote up here on the screen? Short-term goals create opportunities for members of your movement to work together for the cause and build momentum. So what I, and I encourage all of our team leaders at our church, come up with small things. Not, don't say we're going to do this for the rest of our lives, or we're going to do this every week. <laughs> There's just, that's just too big. So what are you going to do for the next 10 weeks? What are you going to do for the next month? Or what's the next big event on the calendar? Give people small achievable goals. Why? Because when you give them small achievable goals, then you can focus on those specific behaviors that you're trying to focus on to create a culture. And as people achieve those small specific goals, that gives them wins. It gives them success. And success creates hope. And the more hope that people have, the more they will continue to go forward. And the more they continue to go forward, all of a sudden you've got what? Movement. You've got a movement. A movement is about small, achievable successes that you're creating in the lives of people by giving them these goals that they can do and focusing on these behaviors that develop the culture that you're trying to develop. Let me brag on Team 153. Can I hear it for Team 153? Amen. I love this team. You know why? Because they just pick a Saturday. And they say, here's what we're going to do. Show up on this Saturday. This Saturday is an event. Here's a couple of things we're going to do. Because these are values to our culture. We're going to pray. We're going to share the love of Christ with people. I remember in the early days of Team 153, there was about a dozen other ideas of what we could do with that team. And all those other ideas got cut and hit the floor, and we said, we're not going to do them. We're going to do these very achievable, specific things so that as people do them, every time we do one of these events, we're creating a culture in our church. Life groups are the same way. Some people said, I like to do life groups every single week, year-round, for the rest of my life. I'm like, good Lord. You're going to burn out, amen? And people are going to, if it's always going on forever, they, they'll just pick and choose when they want to come because you're always there. But if you say, no, we're going to meet for this amount of weeks, come, here's what we're going to cover, here's what we're going to accomplish, then people will commit to that. And then they can achieve something. And they can say, I did it. And it creates successes in their life. I'm just trying to brag on you folks. You've been doing it right, amen? But this is how we're doing Let me move on to number seven. This one's not even in the article I wrote because they, they uh, shorted me on how many words I could have in the article. 
And so I had to cut this one out, but I, I wish it was in there. And that is stay focused and adaptable. Stay focused and adaptable. In other words, you got to learn to say no or not yet to everything that is not part of the mission. Keep the people focused. That's what we call mission drift. We talk about that around this church. So many things come up and, and come about that you'll get, you'll get your attention off on something else. Nehemiah did this. Nehemiah chapter 6 is an incredible story. So go read it. But I want to point to you to verse number 3. When You're going to read it this week, some of these chapters. And this is where some people tried to come and distract Nehemiah and get him to quit what he was doing. And verse number 3 of Nehemiah 6 this is what it says. So I sent messengers to them saying, quote, I am doing important work. I cannot come down. Why should, I, why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? End quote. Now, I like that. They said, Nehemiah, come see us. He said, no, I ain't got time to come see you. You're trying to distract me. You've got an agenda other than the agenda God's given me. So I'm telling you this time, no. Not because he's mean, not because he's cruel, not because he's egotistical, but he's discerning. He knows that these guys were trouble. And he said, no. I'm telling you, friend, you got to stay focused. This world is going to throw a lot at you. And you're going to get distracted. You're going to turn around and realize you done climbed off the wall and left it unfinished. You got to be focused. You got to be adaptable. In other words, you've got to be able to pivot in those moments and do things that maybe you never thought you'd need to do or have to do. But you got to learn as you're working for the Lord. You know, one of my favorite verses in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. Look down there to verse 15. Of that chapter. I'll just read the first four words. The wall was completed. <laughs> Isn't that good? The wall was completed. That's all that matters. He got the job done. He didn't get distracted. He stayed focused. Number eight. Number eight. Celebrate the victors. Celebrate the victors. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 12. Nehemiah chapter 12. Nehemiah chapter 12 is a celebration chapter. If you start reading it in the beginning as they're getting all the priests and the Levites together, just scroll down those verses, keep scrolling all the way down, you'll just see name after name after name. Tons of people that they invited to the party. Get all the way to verse 27, Nehemiah 12. It says, at the ded dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sent for the Levites wherever they lived and brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate the joyous dedication with thanksgiving and singing accompanied by cymbals, harps, and lyres. And go down to verse number 43. So you got all the singers... All the pastors, the priests, all the religious leaders, everybody was there. Then they got all the people together, all those people that were mentioned that were building the wall. And you get all the way down to verse 43, and it says, On that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and the children also celebrated, and Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. In other words, they threw a party. They threw a party and they gave God glory. They celebrated. They celebrated and celebrated. I told you a moment ago they had success and they, they celebrated that success because success creates hope and back-to-back -back successes multiply that hope and sustain that movement and they began to rejoice in that movement and they rejoiced in that hope and they gave God all the glory. Around this church, we're always getting together to celebrate and party. Show up at different restaurants and 
have a good time, recognize different things that are going on. I feel like we need to do it more often. But at least, now hear me, because if you pay close attention, this is a worship service. They made sacrifices. They had all the preachers and all the singers there. Ladies and gentlemen, Sunday morning should be this. It should be a party. It should be a celebration of all the successes of the movements. It's where we come together and we celebrate what God's doing. Amen? Doesn't mean there's not problems. Doesn't mean there's a lot of issues. Still plenty of things we got to still do. But for goodness sake, let's, let's draw aside the beginning of the week on a Sunday morning and celebrate. Let's rest and rejoice in what God's doing. That's what these people did. Number nine, almost done. Practice self-care. Practice self-care. If you go to Nehemiah chapter 8, that's exactly what you'll see. Nehemiah chapter 8, I'm not going to take time to read it this morning. I'll have it in your study notes to look it over. But in Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah literally drew aside. If you take a look right now in your text, you'll see that they came together. You can skip all the way down to the end of the chapter. You'll see a festival was put together. And uh, if you go down to the last sentence of that chapter, this thing lasted seven or eight days like this. What you're seeing is the fact that they took time to draw aside and have prolonged rest, period. Self-care, I call it. Because when you're leading a movement, it's not just about leading change. It's about leading constant change. And when you lead constant change, you're going to burn out if you don't take a break. I remember this past week, a couple of my pastors, we were having a pastor's meeting. A couple of them contacted me and said, it's our anniversary week. Can we skip the meeting? Absolutely you can skip the meeting, we said. Take that time off. Our meeting's not as important as your marriage, amen? amen. You better take your wife out somewhere good. Because we're now we know and we're watching you. And we encourage, take a break. Take a vacation. Don't get scared if you show up on a Sunday and somebody's not here. They need to be gone. They need to take a break. We're working them to death around here. Amen? Most of our people are volunteers. So we encourage them to have self-care because it's not just leading change. It's leading constant change. And you can write this down. Self-care includes both rest and effective delegation of responsibilities. Keep going back to who are you giving your ministry off to? Who are you giving it away to? Who are you delegating these responsibilities to? Because if you don't delegate, you're going to burn out. You're going to burn out. All right, number 10. Finally this morning, last point. Keep saying yes to Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. That is a motto of our church. Keep saying yes to Jesus. Any movement that is not spirit-led is not worth the time and energy. It means God's in control. He was in control of Nehemiah chapter 1. And when you get to the end of the book, God's still in control. Amen? And he's in control in every chapter in the middle. He is the one leading the movement. Keep saying yes to Jesus. That's how you keep moving forward. And remember this. Anything worth doing must be done by faith. It can't just be you went and studied how to do a movement or you even took these 10 points down and said, well, Jason, show me how to do it. I'm going to check this list off. Bro, you're going to fail if you do that. I would fail if I just do this. It's about letting God direct your steps. Amen? This, these are just principles I'm giving you. It's all about focusing that God is the one in charge. Say yes to him. Don't ever put yourself on a pedestal. Keep giving away the calling. Give away the mission. Look to Him. Say yes to Him. And the more you do that, the more He'll keep putting on your plate. 
And he'll say, you've got the capacity for more. You trusted me with a little, I'm going to give you a lot. And in the middle of that, you're practicing your Sabbaths, and you're taking your rest and your vacations. And we're celebrating, and we're rejoicing, and we're taking care of ourselves, and we're working as a team. And all the time, we keep moving forward. Romans 4.23 says everything that is not of faith is sin. And that he includes a successful movement or a successful organization. If it's not of faith, it's sin. Amen? It needs to be by faith. Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God. The bottom line is here at Huntington Beach Church, we exist to please God. That's why we're here. That's our only agenda. We don't want to be a disgrace to the name of Jesus. So let's build the walls. Let us pray. Our Father, in the name of Christ, I do pray that you could take the gleanings of these principles from the Word of God out of the book of Nehemiah and instill them into our hearts, and into our actions, into our values. Father, help us to practice these things with wisdom and much more. There's so much more that could be said. So help us to listen to you and say yes to you. And Father, I pray for every leader in this room, some leading in the church, leading in their homes, society, workplace, school, leaders all over this congregation. I pray for each and every one of them that they'd have the wisdom of Nehemiah. And I also pray for the followers because some of us are a lot better at following and supporting others. I want to pray for the followers here. For without the followers, there would be no movement. I pray that you encourage the followers. I pray, Father, that you strengthen them. I pray, Father, you give them ownership in their soul of the movement. That they'll know they're not just doing it for their leader, they're doing it for God. And I pray you bless them. And together, may we all work together and walk together as a family. We are the Jerusalem of God, the Israel of God in Christ Jesus. And may we bring you glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.